Okay. I think we're almost complete so we can get going again. Um, so as you may have noticed, the kind of uh, lectures today are a little bit more on the introductory side in the interest of getting uh, less experienced people up to speed. And this, this talk will also be in that kind of mode. Uh, for those of you who are more experienced, don't worry. I mean, the more advanced topics are coming coming soon. But um, the idea of this talk is just to really uh, say what data independent acquisition uh, means or, or what SWOT means and, and take a first look at what the concepts might be for analyzing the data. So this is what I'll try to cover. Why do we need DA? I think this has been covered a lot by Rudy already, so this, we can go over this quickly. So what do we actually mean by data independent acquisition? Um, how DIA or SWOT, what are the principles of operation of the, of the instruments and so on? And a first look at how we analyze the data in this so-called uh, peptide-centric analysis or has also been referred to as targeted data extraction, uh, what some of the advantages of, of doing DA might be, and also a little bit of outlook. So why do we need something other than, than, shock, than DDA or, or SRM, PRM to, to quantify proteomes? So let's assume again as, as similar what, uh, uh, to what Rudy said, that the, the kind of proximal goal of any of these experiments is some kind of quantitative matrix where you have uh, the, the samples and the conditions in, in one dimension and the analytes either being peptides or inferred proteins in this dimension and, and some, some quantity, right? And this, this matrix can have different dimensions, but let's, let's imagine that this is going to be, generally speaking, the goal. And Rudy already told you that uh, in DDA, we have particular characteristics. In SRM, people tried to uh, make the quantification more uh, robust and reproducible. And uh, the question here is whether we can um, have something that has both of these characteristics in, in a single method. So I'm going to show now a lot of uh, 3D projections of the data. And the, the goal here is just to sort of um, uh, explain how the sampling of the precursor space is happening in various methods. So first, we're just going to re, uh, uh, go over the, the sort of SRM and the DDA cases and then move on to, to DIA later. So uh, in this, we always have these three dimensions, right? We have the mass to charge dimension, we have some retention time dimension, the chromatographic dimension, and we have some kind of uh, intensity dimension. So if you look from here, you're going to see a mass spectral projection, so you're going to see spectra, and if you look from this direction, oops, this direction, you're going to see a chromatographic projection, like uh, ion chromatography, for example. And so let's uh, take a look at some DDA data. So here, uh, each of these gray lines indicates uh, one precursor scan. And what you see is there's very, these various different peptides. There's a blue one and a red one and some gray ones. And they're, they're eluding, as a, uh, uh, eluding from the column in chromatographic time. And their mass is somewhere in this precursor range here from 500 to 525. And what you see, and here's the isotope patterns, and you see they have, they have some kind of elution pattern like this. And we can extract ion chromatograms at the MS1 level and, and uh, uh, also quantify these. And this is, this is very what, commonly what's done in uh, DDA quantitative analysis. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, what we have actually in terms of the MS2 sampling of the precursor space is snapshots in time. So uh, this blue peptide starts eluding. The instrument looks in the MS1 survey scan and says, OK, I'm going to collect an MS-MS spectrum. And what's depicted in this box here, this blue box or this, this red box, is the precursor isolation space, right? So you're trying to isolate the monoisotopic, um, uh, uh, the monoisotopic peak of the precursor, or maybe a little bit more. And you're isolating this and collecting an MS-MS spectrum, right? So the point here is that in DDA, uh, the precursor space is sampled by MS2 spectra um, discontinuously both in the mass dimension and in the retention time dimension, right? So it's, it's, of course, very good because you get a fast number of identifications, a high number of identifications, because you can do this pretty quickly. Uh, it's instrument-driven. This means it might be biased towards the, the highest abundance peptides, and it may not be consistent across samples because of this kind of stochastic element. So this is what we've heard already. In SRM, we have a different situation uh, where we still have these same peptides, but we tell the instrument in advance that we're going to sample uh, these peptides over and over again and, and only these ones, right? So what I want, to, want you to notice is, again, these boxes, right? These depict the precursor isolation, um, precursor isolation window in the Q1 of the SRM method. And then what we get is, uh, uh, in, the, in the Q3 space, uh, we get fragment ion series. And the point here is that uh, these signals are 
sampled by M the precursor space is sampled by MS2 signals continuously in the retention time dimension, but discontinuously in the mass dimension, right? So there's a whole bunch of the mass dimension which is, which is not being sampled. And so, as you've heard, this can be very consistent and lead to accurate quantification. Uh, it's completely user-driven and, and deterministic, but you may only be able to analyze a small number of, of precursors per run. So what do we actually mean by data-independent acquisition? So this term was introduced in a, a paper 2004 by, from John Yates' group. And, I mean, first we should say what it explicitly not is, and it's, ex it's explicitly not data-dependent, right? So there's no stochastic precursor selection. That's the first thing to understand. And some of the features of DIA are, one, that it has a fixed duty cycle, so the instrument operates on a, on a completely fixed duty cycle, and, and it's completely deterministic. So this is like SRM, in a sense, but, but unlike DDA. Um, it's untargeted and, and unbiased state acquisition, so there's no, you don't have to feed it a target list. So this is, in a sense, like DDA, but unlike SRM, for example. Uh, and usually what you're aiming to do is, as Rudy showed, is, is to have comprehensive sampling of the precursor space, sorry, this is to say precursor space in, in, with MS2 spectra. And usually we're talking, in order to achieve this comprehensive sampling of the precursor space, we're usually uh, implementing a method that requires wide precursor isolation windows in order that we can, we can, we can achieve this. And usually what this leads to is very complex mixture MS2 spectra because you're co-isolating uh, multiple precursors in, in the same precursor isolation window. So here's a, a figure I stole from, from Tina. She's writing a, a kind of a tutorial paper on SWATH MS. And, and this, the idea of this is to kind of depict the, the sort of history of DIA to say, well, this has been around for some time now. This was the, the paper from the Yates group I mentioned. There was also one from... Dave Goodlett, which, which did something similar, except without the windowed acquisition, he tried to fragment everything. This kind of led to MSE and various implementations of this. So I should say that this x-axis uh, depicts the uh, precursor isolation window, so the width of the precursor isolation window. So there are some DIA methods which use very narrow, some in medium, some high. And uh, on the y-axis is the, is the time dimension. So these are the earliest papers. And what you can see is that later, as, as time moved on, we've had a, a lot of different development. And we are kind of operating in our lab somewhere in this, this space here, what we refer to as SWAT. So one, one also point to be made here is that, uh, as Tina said, there's a lot of different names for things. You can see this uh, from this slide pretty clearly. And the way I tend to think about this, and you might hear the words DIA and SWAT used interchangeably, the way I tend to think about this is that uh, these are all data independent acquisition methods, right? They come, they, they all have this kind of uh, deterministic uh, uh, duty cycle aspect to them that they're, they're explicitly not DDA, uh, but they have, but there's many different ways to do it. And so we tend to use this kind of medium band isolation for the precursor, uh, isolation in the precursor space, and we tend to use uh, what I referred to as this kind of peptide-centric or, or targeted data extraction. That's kind of, so I'm, what I'm trying to point out is that SWATH is kind of a subset of, of the DIA world, and there are also many other subsets, and they're kind of somehow related to each other. So this is just to try and clarify this. And again, in historical terms, this is what the kind of curve looks like if you do a PubMed query for uh, some of these terms that tries to capture the activity of DIA or SWATH over the years. What you see is that, indeed, it's been around for a long time. There were... Uh, lots of kind of technical papers and proof of concept studies, but really it was a around sort of five years ago when the thing started to take off, and this was really due to kind of faster instruments on the one hand, but also smarter data analysis. And this has really led to a lot of more intense method development and a lot of uh, practical implementations and, and applications. And so I think that we, well, at least we hope this is going to continue growing. So let's go back to this 3D projection. So... And now I've said what some of the features of DIA are, so what does that look like from this precursor isolation space uh, um, viewpoint? So here's again our, our blue and red peptides, and now what we're going to do is we're going to apply a DIA method, and we're going to enlarge the precursor isolation space, so in this case it's going from 500 M over Z to 525. And what that means is that all of these peptides in the box here, the blue one, the red one, the gray ones, whatever else is there, are going to be co-isolated and they're going to be fragmented, co-fragmented together. And now if we look at the MS2 spectrum, what we have is uh, fragment ions from all of these precursors mixed together in, in mixture spectra. So in, in the kind of terms I was talking earlier, the, the MS signals 
are uh, the, the precursor space is sampled by the MS2 signals continuously, uh, both in time but uh, in the mass, mass dimensions, right? So we, we sample everything, we attempt to sample everything, um, but it comes at the cost of having highly complex uh, mixture spectra at the MS2 level. And so what you can see is that if you know where to look and you know what the uh, appropriate fragment ions are, you can still retrieve a, a, a specific signal. And it, it kind of, as Rudy mentioned earlier, it ends up looking something like, uh, like SRM data. And so what we're saying is that the instrument is forced to fragment all precursors in every cycle, and we have consistent acquisition of MS2 spectra for all analytes within the limit of detection. And we hope that this will lead to reproducible quantification capabilities uh, similar to, to what's available with SRM. So Rudy already showed this, uh, uh, this figure, more or less. Uh, so this is a, just another view of that, right? So here we have the retention time, the mass to charge. Each of these little black dots is a, is, is a peptide, essentially. And we try to comprehensively sample this precursor space by having these wide windows of 25, 25 mass to charge units. And what we refer to as one swath is the ensemble of fragment ion spectra collected over the retention time uh, over, the, over the whole gradient, right? So the fragment ions belonging to this precursor isolation window considered over the whole gradient is, is one swath. And as Tina mentioned earlier, the cycle time is important. So we're doing chromatography-based quantification. That means this cycle time needs to be kept at a level which is compatible with getting multiple peaks over the, uh, the elution of this peptide. Um, and the whole range that we cover, as, as I mentioned, in this kind of first... Uh, First implementation was 400 to 1200, and if you had 25 windows, this would take uh, 32, sorry, 25, 25 MZ width windows, this would take 32 of these swaths to cover this space. And we are typically operating at about 100 milliseconds per MS2 spectra, and this leads to a cycle time of about three seconds. So we now actually generally run this a, a little bit faster, but this, this was the, the original method. And just to point out as well, also what Tina mentioned, that we, we do need to be able to sample uh, over uh, consistently over the chromatographic peak in order to get good quantification. So this is a SRM figure actually from a paper by Vince Lang now some years ago, but I think people found it quite useful. And what, what's, what it's trying to point out here is that the frequency at which you sample here um, allows you to get a more accurate or less accurate representation of what the peak actually, actually looks like. So if we have a 30-second peak here, then we need to have... Uh, three or four second uh, cycle time in order to, to, to sample over this peak and, and reconstruct, it, reconstruct it accurately. So just to summarize again, this, this sort of precursor isolation uh, dimensionality, because I think it's, it's important, is that in DDA we have this kind of stochastic uh, selection uh, where you have, uh, it's discontinuous in the retention time and the mass um, spaces. So, uh, uh, but you have a lot of snapshots of individual peptides at, at any given point in time, and you can identify a lot of things. In SRM, we have continuous measurements in the retention time dimension, but it's discontinuous in the mass dimension. And this means that uh, you can quantify a small number of things, but you can't quantify all peptides at the same time because you can't, you don't have to have, uh, have enough instrument time to do this. But if you now increase this precursor isolation window and you uh, say, I'm going to, co-isolate all these peptides at once, and I'm going to have a complicated mixture MS2 spectra, then you can cover the whole mass to charge space, and you can be continuous in the mass dimension, but also be continuous in the retention time dimension. And uh, this comes at the cost, of course, of having this, these complex MS2 spectra. So uh, in case you're curious about where this swath name came from, this was um, an analogy with... Uh, Swath satellite mapping, where if you want to make a picture of the Earth, then you have this satellite kind of circle around the world, various around the Earth many, many times, and each time it maps a, a certain strip or a swath of the Earth and then essentially reconstructs this back in the, in the computer. And this was the analogy made by uh, Ludovic Gillet when, when this technique was originally developed, in, in, uh, or, or developed in our lab at least. One thing I want to mention is that a few, you've heard a few times that these, the windows that we're using, so here again I'm showing the precursor isolation windows, so from 400 to 1200, and in this depiction we have uh, 25 mass to charge width windows, and they're equal width, and they go from, there's 32 of these going from 400 to 1200. But what's overlaid here is the, is, is a, the density of the actual signal 
coming from peptides in this range. And what we see is that um, from 400 to 800, let's say, there's much more peptides than there are from 800 to 1,200. So what we realize after a little while is that it makes sense to change the window width here. So what we do is uh, have these variable window methods where the smallest window is in, in the most busy range of the, um, of the precursor isolation space are, are something like six or seven mass charge units wide, whereas at, up here at around 1,200, where there's very few peptides, they're, they're 90 units wide. And uh, this, this benefits the number of peptides you can detect on the order of sort of 15 to 20 percent in, in very complex samples. In less complex samples, as you might imagine, it doesn't, doesn't really help that much because we, we don't have this problem of co-isolation of many peptides together necessarily. Um, so the last thing I want to say in this part is uh, what kind of instrumentation is typically used here. And the most common uh, implementation, so we tend to use QTOF, this is quadrupole time of flight. Uh, other groups have used uh, instrumentation like QExactive, so quadrupole orbit trap, or, or, or also quadrupole linear ion trap, orbit trap layouts like in the fusion. Um, but I think what's most of the uh, successful imp implementations have in common these days is that you have a quadrupole, a mass selective quadrupole in the front end that allows you to do the precursor isolation. Of these, of these windows effectively, and you have some kind of uh, medium or high resolution uh, mass analyzer in the back end that, that allows you to um, get high resolution MS2 spectra. And so many people ask also, can we do this on LTQ orbit traps? And the answer is, well, maybe you can, but the most successful implementations these days are, are some combination of, of these mass analyzers. And so we, we pr primarily are using this QTOF layout. But I think uh, we'll also have people like uh, Mike McCoss and, and Lucas Reiter talking about the details of doing this kind of experiment on, on Orbit Trap platforms later in the week. Um, OK, so this is what I just wanted to try and get across again, if, if you didn't understand it from the morning, what the, what the sort of dimensionality of the data is. Are there any questions on that topic at the moment? Or I will keep going. OK. So uh, now I want to say something about how the, how the data analysis is working. And so you might have heard these terms, either targeted data ex extraction or, or peptide-centric analysis. Um, so I want, to, I want to try and say what this means. So here's again this isolation window. This precursor isolation window is indicated by these, these kind of gray uh, dotted lines. And we have these three peptide isotope envelopes, which are being co-isolated together. Uh, uh, and being fragmented, and what we get is this complex mixture spectra. So we have fragments from the purple guy, fragments from the yellow, and also from the red ones, and they're all mixed together in the same MS2 spectra, and we, uh, of course, in real life, they're not colored, so we don't know where they came from. All, all we have is just this big mess. And the question is, uh, can we actually interpret this type of data using a standard uh, database uh, search like mascot or something like this? And the answer is, well, certainly not, not directly. Uh, you might sort of identify the most abundant peptide, but it will, it will struggle to, to identify the rest. And so uh, um, you'll hear later in the week about more advanced methods that are kind of based on deconvolution that try to link the purple fragments to the purple precursor, but that's, that's not what we're concerned with at the moment. Uh, so our, our approach to this was to say, well, what if we already know something uh, in advance about the peptides that we're interested in? So can we if, we, if we already know what those peptides look like to the mass spectrometer, will it be possible to dig those signals uh, out of these very complex mixture spectra that we observe? And so here's, here's a depiction of a, here's a real um, uh, swath spectra from uh, 600 to 625. So these are all these fragmentines from whatever... Precur peptide precursors have been isolated in this range at 600 to 6225 at this, at this instant in, in time in the retention time space. Um, but now let's say, and so this is again one of these spectra that it would be very difficult to interpret using standard DDA database search methods because, because there are fragment ions from, from many different peptides. But what if we said we already knew that there might be a particular peptide in there and we're just going to go in and look for it? So here's, a, here's some peptide sequence that we might be interested in. And what I've highlighted here is the... Um, the, f the fragment, so let's say we've, we've already analyzed this peptide in a standard classical kind of DDA analysis, and we know what the major fragment ions are. And so what I've highlighted here is the major fragment ions from this 
particular peptide uh, amongst the kind of zoo of, of peaks here that are coming from, from other peptide precursors. And what you can see is that although we know these are the major fragmentines of this peptide, they're kind of not, certainly not the, the, the ma most major uh, peaks in the spectrum, right? So they're kind of down in the grass a little bit. And this, is, this kind of also shows you that this type of spectrum will be very difficult to interpret using classical methods. But now that we know that this might be in there, what we can do is, is, is try to dig this out, right? So we do this, this data acquisition in, in SWAF mode. We collect one of these very complex MS2 level spectra. And then we say, okay, we're going to go looking for a particular uh, um, peptide. And we know that these are the major fragment ions of this peptide. So we can kind of zoom in and say, okay, we know that there should be a fragment ion here. And there is indeed uh, this isotope envelope for this Y5 fragment ion. So this, this is a good start. And then we can now go and look for all these other uh, fragment ions and we can look for them as a function of retention time, right? So we can do extracted ion chromatograms of these, these fragment ions and plot them. And now what we have is these are each different color is the fragment ions mapping onto this peptide. And what we can see is now something that looks a little bit like SRM data. And there's a signal group here that, uh, where all these fragment ions are co-eluting. And so this is a good indication that this might be the peptide that we're interested in. And so we have uh, also automated and, and sort of uh, systematic ways to score whether this is the correct uh, peak group or not. And this, this is also these characteristics like the coelution, do the fragment ion intensities uh, correspond to what we already know about this peptide. These types of scores, uh, Tina alluded to earlier, but this, this, this methodology will be uh, discussed in much more detail tomorrow by, by Ludovic and Isabel. But this is just to say that a framework exists uh, in which we can, we can analyze this data according to these scores. And so this, just to go back to this three-dimensional view, this is what it now looks like if we input this, this reference spectrum, this prior knowledge, right? So here's again uh, this fragment ion spectra from, from this uh, precursor isolation window from 500 to 525. And if we now sort of project on this reference spectrum, right, these, these blue lines indicate the relative fragment ion intensities for the peptide that we're looking for. And we can extract ion chromatogram. We, we project this onto the swath data. We can extract ion chromatograms. And what you see is that essentially uh, you get a nice signal group that looks, again, like SRM data. So by, by kind of inputting some prior knowledge and some reference knowledge into this analysis, we can look for just the things that we're interested in. Even though the spectrum is very complex, we, all we want to is extract is the things, is the fragment ions that we know are related to our peptide, right? So there are several different uh, uh, software analysis pipelines which you will try out, uh, hopefully during the week, and you'll also hear much more about in, in various lectures. I just mentioned one of these at the moment. This is the one developed in our group. This is called OpenSwath, but it's essentially doing what I've just described, but now formalized in software. So it means what, what we have here is a spectral library, right? This is the prior knowledge. So the, so the prior knowledge about how the peptides that we're interested in behave in the mass spectrometer, meaning how they behave, behave chromatographically, but also how they behave from a, from a fragmentation perspective. And what we do is extract ion chromatograms for these peptides, and then we have scoring systems to see which peak groups are, are the correct scorings and, and, and ways to control the FDR. But again, this is going to come in much more detail tomorrow. So Tina already made some, uh, some comparisons with, with what SRM looks like. I'm just going to sort of go over this quickly again because, uh, again, I think it's important. So here's a standard kind of SRM setup where you have uh, a Q1 filter, which is set to kind of unit resolution or, or maybe 0.7, something like this. You have a Q3 filter that's set the same way. And what I'm showing here is the kind of pseudospectra for, these, for this particular uh, peptide. So we're interested in, let's say now, this green guy is the target. We isolate the green peptide, but this red one is coming along for the ride. Then everything gets fragmented. Then we have the fragments from the red one and the green one together. And then we, we achieve specificity by having uh, the Q3 set to analyze one of, these, one of these green fragments. So this is what was explained in a lot of detail this morning. And, and the data looks something like this if you take, kind of take a snapshot in, in any given time. So these red boxes are indicating... Uh, the green and red boxes are indicating this, this Q3 isolation width, and you see usually you have a clean signal, but sometimes you might have an interference that comes because this peptide, this red one, happens to have the same precursor mass, the fragment happens to have the same mass, and, and they're pretty close to each other, and now you have an interference. Um, in, in swath mode, 
we are now replacing this Q3 with a time of flight analyzer, meaning that we have high resolution data in MS2 now. So this is kind of allowing us to open the Q1 isolation window. So we now say we're going to not have not one MRZ, but 25 MRZ. So that means a lot more of these colored peptides are now coming through this Q1 filter. They're all getting co-fragmented together, so we have much more fragments uh, coming through the collision cell than we did up here. But now we're, we're separating them using a high-resolution or medium-resolution mass analyzer, like a time of flight, or, or this could be an Arbitrap. And so we still have these three uh, fragmentines that we're interested in the MSMS scan. Uh, but now we can draw, make a smaller box here. So what we're going to do is extracted ion chromatograms of the um, fragment ions that we're interested in. Because we have high-resolution data, we can make our extracted ion chromatogram width uh, sufficiently narrow to, to keep out this, this red uh, interfering um, fragment. The problem is, of course, that when, of course, that we have all these other fragment ions in the background too, right? This is, these are all these fragment ions are all being measured. But, but actually, for our purposes, it may not matter because we don't want to interpret this spectrum as a whole spectrum. We just want to look for the things that we're, we are interested in and we know, we know should be there. So we don't need to worry too much about these, the rest of these fragmentines unless they're kind of isobaric with the fragmentines that, that we are interested in. So we can still have interferences. So for example, here's a, here's a green guy with, a, with a, I think, a blue one beside it. So this has got an interference. But actually, if, it, if there is an interference, we can also dynamic, because we've measured the whole spectrum, we can also dynamically look for um, other fragmentines that might be useful. So these green ones over here are not interfered with, right? So we can, we can select these ones instead. So there's some flexibility in terms of the data analysis into, in terms of what, what fragmentines we want to actually analyze. Similarly with PRM, so uh, now we have this narrow uh, Q1 filter here, but we also have the high resolution analyzer like the time of flight of the Orbitrap back here. And uh, let's compare that with SWAS. So now we have very high selectivity at Q1, and we have very high selectivity in the MS2 spectra as well, because we have narrow isolation window here, and we have high-resolution data here. So this is kind of, in a way, the, 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 the best situation from a selectivity perspective. This is very high selectivity, and we can, we, you can see that the spectra are much more simple, and we have the high-resolution data that we can extract uh, and narrow uh, extraction windows. Uh, but the problem is we can't cover the whole precursor mass range um, using these 1 uh, one z windows, or at least not with the current generation of instruments. We can't do this effectively. So we sort of are sacrificing in, in, in swath mode uh, some selectivity in order to get this, this kind of comprehensive uh, um, data acquisition. So that's what uh, that was the idea of this paper written by Ludovic Gillet, who will talk, I think, tomorrow about how we analyze the data. So the, the, the sort of high-level concept was that, so this DIA uh, idea, as I mentioned, was not really a new idea, this kind of slicing up the precursor space and collecting these uh, multiplexed MS2 spectra. But I think what was relatively new was the idea of including prior knowledge and doing a kind of targeted data analysis, or what's now kind of referred to as peptide-centric data analysis. So these two things combined together, this kind of comprehensive acquisition where you get very complex spectra, plus some prior knowledge about what these peptides look like, allowed you to get back to a place where, where the data looks relatively like, like SRM data. And this, this we know um, from, from the discussion this morning is, has a lot of advantages. And so Tina already mentioned the, the need for, uh, for libraries. Uh, so this is uh, uh, what the library looks like. Uh, here's a protein. Here's the peptide sequence. We know what the precursor and fragment uh, masses are. So these four rows correspond to one peptide of one particular protein. We know what the charge states of the precursor and the fragments are. And importantly, we know the relative intensities of these fragment ions. And we know something about their chromatographic behavior on this normalized retention time space, which I will describe in a bit more detail later on. So. Uh, there's a, another lecture in the afternoon about spectral libraries, so uh, don't worry about that for the moment, but just, just to know that this is the type of information that we need to do this uh, peptide-centric data analysis. We need to know something in advance. So what might the advantages of, of SWATH be? So this is a, 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 a figure from the original paper by Ludovic, and here he compared um, uh, dilution series of this peptide, right? So this is concentration of the peptide on the x-axis 
going from high to low here, and this is the signal intensity on the, on the y-axis. And the different, uh, so the, the, the little white box is MS1 quantification, the green triangle is SWAF MS quantification, the circles are the uh, database search engine score, so if you were do, if in the DDA analysis, uh, whether you could identify the peptide or not, and the X's are if you analyze this in SRM mode. And the thing to point out here is, uh, so people ask us usually, uh, what's the differences in sensitivity in these different methods? Well, so the, probably the least sensitive is, is whether you could get an identification in shotgun mode, because if this is a complex sample, then it may be, as this, this peptide is con as diluted down, you, it never gets selected for, for MSMS, or, or there may be other reasons that spectrum isn't high quality enough. Uh, the next one is MS1 label free, right? So even if you don't have an MSMS spectrum to identify the peptide, you might still be able to uh, detect the precursor signal and do MS1 level quantification. The next most sensitive is, is SWATMS, so what I've just described there. And as Tina said, the, the limit of detection for SRM is still uh, lower than, than for SWAT mode. But this is kind of the typical, or, and this, we've, we've observed this kind of order of sensitivities in, in other experiments as well. This has kind of been ma maintained over the years, at least in our hands. Um, and so... How does it, what about some other data to say how does it directly compare with SRM? So this is a, again, a paper from Yan Sheng Lu, and this is, um, the sample here is formerly on glycosylated peptides in human plasma, so a, a more, uh, less complex matrix, let's say, but this is a direct comparison of, uh, of about, yeah, 40 peptides that, that were detectable by either by SRM or by SWATMS. And what you see is that SRM can detect 37 and SWATMS 33. So the limit of detection, the sensitivity of the SRM method is still uh, a little bit better, but the, the CVs are, are relatively similar. So, so we, we still are not as good as, as SRM in SWATH mode, but it's also not that far away. And uh, this is also an example from the, from the first SWATH paper. So... Uh, Again, a direct comparison with SRM. So if you had a whole bunch of proteins that you're interested in, these happen to be yeast uh, metabolic proteins, and this is kind of a classical yeast experiment where uh, you change the carbon source over time and uh, there's a lot of differential regulation of some of yeast metabolic enzymes called dioxic shift experiment. This is essentially just to say... Uh, if you measure it by, by either by uh, SRM or by SWATMS, you get, I mean, very similar answers in, in biological terms. And so, again, we, we have slightly less sensitivity in SWATH, so 43 detected by SWATH were, dete were detected out of the 45, which could be detected by SRM. So it's still not quite as good, but it's, it's also not that far away. Some other kind of uh, advantages over, over SRM, for example, would be, uh, let's say you have, uh, this is now some, some, well, let's imagine it was, it was SRM data and you have these two peak groups and we're going to talk about uh, later on how to, and Tina already mentioned a little bit, how to decide which one is the correct group, but it seems like in this case these two peak groups look basically exactly uh, like each other. They're, they're not very far apart in retention time. These are the, the fragment ions, right? But So how do you say which one's the correct one? So from an SRM data, you would probably struggle to, to differentiate these if you had only measured these three, uh, these three transitions for this peptide. Well, the nice thing about SWAF data, or, or as mentioned, PRM data, you can go back and, and extract more transitions. So uh, if we now add these uh, Y5, Y4, and B4 fragment ions, we see that the, they're consistent with this signal on the right, but they're not consistent with this, with this signal on the left. So there's somehow uh, the high-resolution data, MS2 data, gives you more flexibility in terms of um, which fragment ions you want to select to, to do the quantification. Uh, similarly, um, as I mentioned before, I think in, in the SRM case, if, what, if, what if you have uh, an interference? So this is a peptide which is uh, measured both in N14 and N15 labeled, and you can see that one of these transitions, the uh, Y11 doubly charged fragment ion, which was a good for, uh, uh, transition in the uh, in the light sample has a kind of obvious interference in the heavy sample. So another kind of benefit of this, this type of data is that you can just say, well, I don't want to have this blue one anymore, and you can just kick it out and say, I'm going to go back and find another transition. So now we've kicked out
out Y11, doubly charged, and added in Y8, and you can see that this, these, these now all collute nicely, and we don't have this, this interference problem anymore. So this is just to get at the idea that the, the data is kind of rich in the, in the MS2 space, and there are, there are kind of options in, uh, in terms of kind of dynamically uh, reanalyzing the data, which you may not necessarily have in, in more classical, uh, for example, SRM mode. And another idea that was uh, sort of put forward at the time when this paper came out was the idea of kind of dynamically, uh, iteratively mining the data, right? So if you were going to do a swath measurement, uh, sorry, an SRM measurement, and you wanted to measure all these uh, yeast metabolic proteins, and you, you know you said, oh, that's great, these are interesting, interesting things that happens, and, and then you go back to the biologists and they say, well, we'd like to know something about this other set of proteins, and you say, well, we already did the measurement, so too bad. But if it's if you're done a DIA or swath measurement, you can just go back and see if these peptides are there, right? So here's a second set of proteins that the that the biologists were interested in this case. So this is electron transport chain, and these were just. Uh, re-extracted from the swath data, right? So we didn't have to go back and do any other measurements. And what you can see is that, oh, many things are differentially expressed and it leads you to potentially more insight in the biology. And uh, this, this would essentially would not have been possible with the, with the SRM data. So I think kind of Rudy covered this already, uh, but these, this is what DDA looks like. This is what SRM or PRM looks like. And this is at least the goal for what, DD, what DIA should look like. And so you, you might argue that this is an unfair representation of, of DDA data in this, in this current environment with the very fast scanning machines and so on and improvements in alignment software. And I would accept that that might be true, but this is at least how it was when, when I think when we started developing these swath methods. So this is at least the kind of historical motivation to, to develop this type of, of approach. But this, this is again the goal. So uh, you, I guess you will see during the week whether you agree whether this is possible or not. So let's just to summarize. Um, these are the, the kind of list of things that I, that I said at the start, the, the features of DIA data. So we have a fixed duty cycle, which is entirely deterministic. So this is kind of unlike DDA, uh, but like SRM or PRM. We have untargeted and unbiased data acquisition. This is unlike uh, SRM, but more like DDA in that sense. Uh, our goal is to achieve comprehensive sampling of the precursor uh, space with MS2 spectra. This usually means we need to have wide precursor isolation windows and not unit precursor isolation windows. And this usually means this is going to lead to complex mixture MS2 spectra that need uh, that can't be interpreted using kind of standard DDA uh, database searching methods. And in our hands, at least, uh, this kind of idea of target analysis or peptide-centric analysis based on prior knowledge has helped to make this idea feasible. And this is kind of what, what made it work in our hands. But I, mean, I think that you will hear this week that there are many other ways now to uh, analyze this data. And um, they're, they're also very interesting. And I think that actually as the data gets better, uh, the, the, the kind of relevance of this prior knowledge starts to decrease. And as the data gets better, it gets more uh, simple to, to analyze it from, from in a de novo way without this kind of reference knowledge. So we suggests that this, this, the data is kind of SRM-like in its quantitative characteristics in terms of the data completeness and linear dynamic range and so on. We, we, it's not quite as sensitive as I've shown a couple of times, but it's, it's approaching this. And I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that the, the data is very flexible. So we can do kind of classical uh, targeted proteomics-like analysis where we look for 100 proteins or we can do more large-scale analysis where we try to look for every, everything we can. And you will see over the course of the week how, how those various things are done. Uh, any questions on the data analysis or anything at this time? Okay, so uh, I'm almost done. I just want to kind of have two more slides in terms of, of outlook. Um, so... One question is how to analyze the data, right? So as I said, you're going to hear a lot about this week, but you could imagine trying to analyze the data in a more focused way, as I mentioned, just extracting some, some particular set of proteins that you're interested in, or trying to uh, analyze, uh, try to extract information for, for everything that you can, or, or you can imagine 
anything in between there. So here you kind of have a, a very solid hypothesis. Here you have not really any hypothesis, or you could have something in between, some kind of weak or more general hypothesis. And I think this is more like what you would expect to see with this kind of SRM style quantification with, uh, with known targets or, or no hypothesis at all. One, one thing to remember is that even if you do this kind of more targeted uh, SRM style quantification, you can, you can still reanalyze the data, right? So this is, this is a benefit. Something you will hear during the week also is that as you go from this kind of more focused analysis of the data towards uh, having uh, no hypothesis and trying to do a more discovery-based proteome and, and asking more questions of the data, uh, you will see that there's kind of a, a burden in terms of multiple testing corrections that you need to make in the statistics. So you may lose sensitivity just by asking more questions of the data um, down here than you would, uh, would up here. But, but I, think, I think what I would emphasize is, is the flexibility, right? So this, this, this flexibility of this type of data allows you to kind of be, be anywhere on this scale. And I think this is really a, a benefit. Um, one thing you can think about is as, as the machines get better and as time goes on, will there be kind of a convergence of, of DIA, DDA, or, or PRM, right? So you could imagine if you had a DIA method where the machine was fast enough to shrink the precursor isolation window down to, down to one mass unit, then uh, you would have a, a very comprehensive data set with, but with very good selectivity. And similarly, well, what if the machines got fast enough that you could do DDA sampling and you would just sample the whole space? Or similarly, if, you, if you're a PRM person, you could imagine that you're doing a PRM experiment, but you're, it's, it's so fast that you can, do, you can cover the whole precursor isolation space, right? These three things amount to the same thing. And I expect this is kind of what will happen in, within, within a couple of uh, generations of instruments. We'll be able to do this type of experiment. And then... Um, the question at this point will be like, how do we analyze the data? Should we kind of treat it more like DDA data and, and just feed it into kind of Sequest and Mascot? Or should we try to do this uh, peptide-centric approach where we, we analyze the data in a, in a more targeted way and based on, based on prior knowledge? And I suspect for kind of quantitative purposes, this will be better. And for, for uh, qualitative purposes, this be better. This, this idea, uh, approach might be better. But, and, but eventually, I think we will have kind of hybrid, hybrid, hybrids of this, these two approaches. So, and then we will also hear about these types of things uh, later in the week. OK, so that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, are there any questions or any comments? Bill. Sorry, Bill, can you use that microphone beside you just because we're recording as well? Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, I think th I think this is a good question for Mike actually, because so at, at ASMS there was a couple of talks from Mike's group and from Jake Jaffe's group where so that what they like to do now to build the libraries is not DDA analysis, right? What they do is this what you suggest. They use narrow windows, DIA, and uh, then they do multiple injections. And it does seem like uh, that they're, and then they, they, they build a library from this and then they apply that library. So they use a rep representative sample, right? And they just do this analysis once uh, with these small windows with multiple injections. And then the rest of the samples that they're interested in the study, they inject with the wide precursor isolation windows use in a regular, more kind of like method what I described. And then they try to align one to the other. But it seems like from, from what was shown uh, in these approaches that there is a significant gap, at least in instruments. I think particularly there'll be a big difference in instruments uh, that facilitate accumulation of ions. So in trapping instruments like, like in QExactive, for example, uh, if you have a large uh, precursor isolation window and you have 10 peptides in that window, uh, you know, you will the amount of any one of those peptides that gets in, into the instrument before you reach the limit of what you can fit in there in terms of because of the automatic gain control, 
uh, will be smaller than if you have some narrow precursor isolation windows, and now you can use all of the space in, in, in the instrument to fill it with a single peptide. So there's, a, there's an inherent kind of gain of sensitivity from the small windows on, on tropping instruments like that. And there was, a large, there was actually a large difference in terms of the number of peptides they could see in their library and the number of peptides they could see uh, when they do the quantitative experiment in the, in the wider window data. So I think, it's, I think depending on what instrumentation you're using and as the instrumentation gets better, I think there, there's, there will be a significant gain, yeah, I would guess. Brandon. So uh, are, when you say like in a couple generations of instruments, are, are you well, I mean, this is hand-waving, right? But okay. Because, <laughs> yeah, the, but I'm, I mean, my... My sense from talking to instrument vendors is that their view is a little bit less less uh, optimistic. <laughs> okay, I mean that's interesting to know. But if if it followed the pattern, right. the rate of innovation that they've had until now, if that continued, I think yeah. then it wouldn't be much more than two or three. But there may be physical reasons why it's hard to. Uh, I mean, it might start to to, to yeah. saturate, right? Yeah, I mean at, le at least from from Thermo, what I'm hearing is that they, that. They, that they are, they feel like they're running up against the upper limit of more, you know, like Moore's law worked great until it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> for for computer processor speed. And okay. So, well, that's a bummer. Well, you know, maybe. <laughs>